Good evening and welcome to the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution. And so to the reason you're here tonight, um, if you're of my generation, there's a good chance that you grew up knowing the story of Rourke's Drift, when around 150 British colonial, British and colonial troops held off a Zulu army of between 3,000 and 4,000 warriors. Uh, the film Zulu with Michael Caine in his first starring role gave a, a memorable account of that battle. What's less well known are the events that took of a much larger battle between British and Zulu forces that took place just hours earlier. So here to throw light on that earlier encounter is military historian Mike Nicholas, uh, as well as specialising in the Anglo-Zulu War and the First and Second World Wars. Mike is also a public speaker for the Commonwealth War Graves Commission and uh, is works at the uh, Tank Museum in Dorset. So please join me in welcoming Mike Nicholas. Okay. So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you all so much for attending my talk, whether in person or online. The story of Isandawana is a subject that I'm really proud to share with you, and by its conclusion tonight, I hope that you will find it as fascinating as I do. It served as one of the greatest defeats in British, but also European, colonial history. In terms of casualties and the conduct of the battle, there are only a few comparable events that spring to mind, such as the British retreat from Kabul in 1842, the Battle of Maywand in 1880, and the Battle of Adwa in 1896. So, to start this lecture, we need to understand the origins of the conflict and why the British became involved. To do this, we need to venture to South Africa, rewinding to the year 1574. The founder of the Zulu tribe was an Nguni chieftain by the name of Mandalela, who led a small handful of followers from central Natal to settle in the region of the Middle White Enflosi River, which is marked by a red dot on the images behind me. The Nguni, by the way, are a subdivision of the Bantu people, who originated from West and Central Africa. His clansmen took their name from his son and heir, Zulu, and thus were subsequently known as Amazulu, otherwise known as people of the heavens. By 1781, the Zulu tribe had swelled to around 1,500 people and began to emerge from an intense power struggle between rival clans. Some of you may recognize the man behind me, this is Shaka Zulu, and it was under his leadership that the Zulus became a truly dominant force in the region. Previously, tribal conflicts had generally concluded with nothing more than a ritual show of force, with both sides being able to walk away with limited casualties. Shaka changed all of this with wars of annihilation, with any survivors being incorporated into the Zulu system. He developed military tactics and introduced new weapons, such as the it Ikawa, a heavy-bladed, short-handled stabbing spear like the one held by this Zulu warrior. Each warrior also carried an Ihuwu, an oval-shaped cowhide shield which had an interesting rule of thumb associated with each one. Shaka's army was around 20,000 strong by this point, um, with conscripted adult males being placed into amabuto, or regiments, relating to their age. Their shields reflected this, with young men carrying golden to all brown shields, while senior warriors carried uh, shields like this one, which were all white with brown patches, or black with white spots. Following Shaka's assassination on the 24th of September, 1828, successive rulers were now faced with a new, more substantial threat. In 1652, Dutch settlers, known as the Boer, had set up the Cape Colony and began encroaching into territories long held by the native South Africans, including the Zulu. 
when French privateers began threatening British shipping on their way to the Cape uh, via, uh, via India, the, Brit uh, the British annexed the region in 1806. Tired of life under British rule, the Boer expanded into the South African interior, setting up two colonies known as the Transvaal and the Orange Free State. By the time Sesweo Kamapanda, the last independent king of the Zulus, had been crowned king in 1873, the crisis had reached breaking point. Boer settlers continued to push through Zulu territorial borders, and as a result, bloodshed was soon to follow. The British, who were against Boer expansion because of their own colonial aspirations for South Africa, renounced the Boers and made clear their support for the Zulus. Tragically, this British support was nothing more than a ruse. In February 1874, William Gladstone's Liberal government was, de uh, was defeated in the general election by Benjamin Disraeli's Conservatives. Queen Victoria was delighted with this appointment as she knew that the Conservatives would offer support at home whilst fiercely protecting British interests abroad. This led to the appointment of Henry Herbert, fourth Earl of Carnarvon, as the new colonial secretary. From the get-go, he was willing to introduce a system of confederation upon the various British and Boer states in South Africa, as well as any native African polities. His conviction clearly stemmed from his involvement with, and the questionable successes of, the Canadian Confederation of 1867. But South Africa was not Canada. The political and military situation was far more complex and far more dangerous. As, Carnarv uh, as far as Carnarvon was concerned, the Cape represented an important link in the imperial network, and thus he endeavoured to give South Africa a confederation which it did not want, but rather what he thought it needed. The question remains open as to whether he failed to consider that confederation would bring the British into conflict, or whether it was simply his strategy all along. Despite British claims of friendship and support, the annexation of the Transvaal on the 12th of April 1877 left the Zulus feeling increasingly isolated and unsure of British intentions. This issue was further compounded by Sir Henry Bartle Frere, the newly appointed High Commissioner of South Africa. It was his actions alone that proved to be the most chilling in the instigation of this tragic conflict. Frere had been put in place to oversee the installation of Lord Carnarvon's unpopular Confederation Bill, and he was already thinking of ways to annex Zululand. With the Transvaal and its ongoing border disputes now falling within his remit, Frere became convinced that the only way to secure peaceful Confederation was to listen to the Boer and remove their main enemy. With a standing conscript army of over 40,000 men, the Zulus were seen as a significant threat to this process. So Frere began accusing the Zulu of trumped up charges of aggression and border, uh, and border incursions. These antagonistic moves by Frere were of great concern to other British colonial administrators. Sir Henry Bulwer, for example, the Lieutenant Governor of Natal, felt he needed to intervene in this dangerous situation. He was deeply suspicious of the charges levelled against the Zulu and found no evidence of aggression. He reported his findings back to London, who became increasingly concerned that significant trouble was brewing in South Africa and strongly urged that a war should be avoided at all costs. With his back against the wall, Frere realised he had to move quickly. Under the pretext that border disputes needed increased military protection, the British government felt they had no choice but to send troops. The simple fact is, is that they had been misled. Frere stated that if war did break out and it went badly for the British, the government would be blamed for its refusal to send reinforcements. On the 11th of December 1878, the road to war was now inevitable. A boundary commission had been set up by Sir Henry Bulwer to investigate the border disputes between the Boer and the Zulu. 
as it was, Ferrer had clearly not considered the integrity of the commission members as they ruled in favour of the Zulu. He decided then to sugarcoat the pill by issuing an ultimatum on the same day as a border verdict. Many of the points raised in the ultimatum were fair and reasonable to Sesueo. However, Frere knew that the Zulu king would never be able to agree to two points. The first of these points was that the Zulu army should be disbanded and the men allowed to go home. The second stated that the Zulu military system would be discontinued and other military regulations would be adopted after consultation with British representatives. This is significant because we must bear in mind that Zulu culture at that time was built on this militaristic structure. It formed the very backbone of their kingdom. And now Frere was saying, get rid of it. Any refusal to do so would be seen as a violation of the ultimatum and another instance of Zulu aggression, all of which was fanned by Frere. Taking full advantage of the delay in messages reaching London from the Cape, Frere ordered the army to be ready on the border of Zululand. He believed that he could launch an invasion and wipe out the Zulu before London could intervene. At the head of the British Expeditionary Force was Lieutenant General Fre Frederick Thesiger, otherwise known as Lord Chelmsford. The Zulu were given 30 days to submit to the ultimatum, but when no response was forthcoming, the troops were given the order to invade. De facto, a state of war now existed between the British and Zulu empires. The British invasion of Zululand began shortly after dawn on the 11th of January 1879. The plan was relatively simple. Three invasion columns would make their way through Zululand and converge on the Zulu capital of Alundi, bringing them to battle and destroying them. In this instance, we will focus solely on the actions of number three column under the command of Colonel Richard Glynn, as it would play a pivotal role in the story of Isandawana. This central column crossed the Buffalo River from the little known station of Rocks Drift and would proceed east along the main Alundi Road. It was a sizable column, uh, consisting of around uh, 4,624 men. The backbone of the column was made up of two battalions from the same regiment, the 24th Regiment of Foot. There were five companies from the 1st Battalion and seven from the 2nd. They were ably supported by 20 companies of locally raised troops, known as the Natal Native Contingent, or NNC. In addition, there were several auxiliary units that were formed from ex-British servicemen and Boer commandos. On top of this, over 2,000 oxen, 67 mules, 220 wagons and 82 carts were used to transport the huge quantities of guns, supplies and food required to sustain the column. Sesueo initially met the news of the British invasion with caution. Despite his standing army having been mobilised since the 8th of January, he was extremely reluctant to deploy his warriors for fear of provoking the British. Uh, on the 12th of January, less than 24 hours after the invasion had begun, this all changed. As a means of provoking the, Z the Zulu, the British attacked and destroyed the homestead of one of Sesueo's most trusted chieftains, Seheo Ingabezi. Seheo himself was attending emergency meetings held at the Zulu Royal Court in Alundi. He was informed that his home had been destroyed, his followers were now scattered, and his livestock had been looted. He also received word that his son had been killed during the battle. It is impossible to know exactly when he would have known about this terrible skirmish, but considering that there were Zulu settlements dotted all over the landscape, and the speed in which his tribesmen could travel on foot, it is not inconceivable to suggest that he heard the news that same evening. It must have hit like a bombshell in an already tense atmosphere within the royal court. As the, Zulu, uh, as the British sorry, uh, continued to advance on the Lundi, the Zulus, particularly those within the younger regiments, demanded a response. Sesueo was now compelled to muster his remaining regiments. 
The main Zulu army left their staging area in the late afternoon of Friday the 17th of January, covering, uh, covering seven miles to their first bivouac on the west bank of the White Enfilosi River. It consisted of the cream of the Zulu army, including young unmarried men in their 20s and 30s, from the likes of the Uve, the Ingoba Makosi, and the Umsija regiments. It also contained married men it, who were in their 40s and 50s from regiments attached to the royal court, such as the Udiloko and the Utulwana. By the second day, the vast army had covered another nine miles, reaching Isophasi military kraal. On the 19th of January, the Zulu army had split into two columns, continuing to advance on a parallel course a few kilometers apart. This was standard practice upon nearing enemy territory, as it prevented the entire army from being surprised on the march. It also demonstrates that the Zulus were not prepared to risk detection at this late stage. On the 20th, the army had moved across open country, camping, uh, camping at the foot of Sapezi Hill. Meanwhile, on that same day, the British continued their advance and had now set up camp at the base of Isandawana Hill. The site was personally selected by Major Clary, Colonel Glynn's principal staff officer. However, it was obvious that this location had some serious tactical disadvantages. This came in the form of two dominant features. The Stony Kopi, a hill due south of the camp, provided an excellent vantage point, whilst the Nakutu Plateau and the Inyoni Ridge are dominating areas of high ground to the left and left front of where the camp stood. Many of the officers preferred the open ground two miles due east of Isandawana. These concerns, however, were ignored by Clary. At dawn the following day, Lord Chelmsford had sent out patrols to locate the Zulu army. Most of these patrols were dispatched to the south and southeast of the camp, but proved fruitless and uneventful. One patrol, however, had an altogether different experience. Lieutenant Edward Brown, an old hand in South African military operations, had led a small patrol of Imperial Mounted Infantry east along the main Alundi Road towards Sipezi. Hours later, gunshots could be heard. If Lord Chelmsford had been more receptive, he may well have considered that the Zulu seemed to be approaching from the east. But it was clearly his conviction that the Zulu were in fact approaching from the southeast. Um, wanting to investigate that ground further, he dispatched Commandant Rupert Lonsdale's 3rd Regiment, Natal Native Contingent, south to scour the Malakata Hills. It was an exhausting day for these men. They had been on the march since dawn and had only reached the base of the hills by noon. They found absolutely nothing. A patrol led by Major John Dartnell of the Imperial Mounted Infantry has spotted something far more disturbing. A large force of Zulu, several hundred strong, was spotted half a mile to the east of the Magogo Hills. This has subsequently become known as the Dartnell Faint. It has been suggested that these warriors have been deliberately detached from the main army to draw the, as many British forces away from East Andawana. Faced with such a large force, Dartnell quickly realized it would be suicidal to attack without support. He hastily scribbled a note to be sent back to the camp. The patrol was now deep in enemy territory and completely isolated from friendly units. To be fair to Chelmsford, the initial Zulu strategy had been to move to the south of the British camp, flanking right before the Buffalo River, and then striking the British camp from the rear. This would effectively cut off their lines of communication and isolate the camp. But with their route now blocked by patrols to the south and southeast, the Zulu chose to outflank the British from the north. A huge Zulu army, at least 20,000 strong, was now concentrated in the hidden folds of the Nguabeni Valley, a mere six miles to the northeast of the British camp. As dawn broke on the 22nd of January, an eerie silence prevailed over the landscape. 
convinced that the Zulu were attacking from the location of Dartnell's initial sighting, Chelmsford was keen to seize this advantage. He reasoned that if he could bring the Zulu, uh, catch the Zulu on the move, sorry, he stood a better chance of bringing them to battle in the open. This prompted him to make a decision that is not too dissimilar to that of an American general by the name of Custer. He decided to split his force. D before moving on, Chelmsford sent an order to Colonel Anthony Durnford, whose number two column had been patrolling along the southern border of Zululand. Durnford's column was to move with all haste and support the main camp at Isandawana. What Chelmsford would not have known is that most of the Zulus Dartnell had sighted the previous day had now withdrawn and were on their way back to rejoin the army. For Inchinwayo Kamaholi, the commander of Zulu forces, it was never his intention to fight the British on the 22nd of January, 1879. Primarily, this was due to a firmly held religious belief. The 22nd of January marked the day of the new moon. For the Zulu, if they ever found themselves in times of conflict or serious trouble, they would always look for changes in the, in the sky which supposedly foretold success or failure, as dictated by the spirits of their ancestors. The moon was to begin her new life at exactly 1.52pm that day. And her dark day which preceded it was considered a bad omen for an engagement in battle. Another factor came from Seshwayo himself, he, who gave specific instructions that the Zulu should not engage the, in the invading British forces. Instead, he proposed that a delegation of Zulu chiefs approach the British with a peace settlement. However, the opportunity that was presented to the Zulu general that day was too good to miss. According to his scouts, the British had split their force not once, but twice. One having been spotted leaving the southern border of Zululand, whilst a larger, more powerful column had been spotted leaving the British camp at dawn. This left the main camp unfortified and lacking in sufficient manpower. These facts alone convince the Zulu general that he may never get a better chance to secure a crushing victory over the British invaders, which in turn would force them into a negotiated peace settlement. He spent most of the morning moving his regiments between the Nguabeni Valley and the Nakutu Plateau above the Isanawana campsite. Primarily, these movements were used to prevent the British from discovering the whereabouts of his army. But he was also trying to buy some time for his warriors to regroup. Chelmsford and most of the officers under his command were under the opinion that they would be doing most of the fighting that day. So the force that was left behind was there simply to look after the camp. Therefore, the officer selected to command the camp was Colonel Henry Burmester Pallane, a talented administrator within the British Army. However, as early as 7.30 a.m., several reports had already landed on his desk stating that large bodies of Zulu had been spotted moving around the camp's perimeter. Well, this was deeply concerning news. The fact of the matter is, no large bodies of Zulu should have been spotted moving anywhere near that camp. Understandably, this compelled Palain to order, uh, give the order to stand to. The men left their breakfasts and deployed along a defensive line in front of the camp. As the morning progressed, the reports increased in volume. There were signs of movement all over the place. And Palain, who had no previous combat experience, was at a loss as to what to do. At around 10.30 a.m., Colonel Durnford arrived in the camp. However, the stage was now set for a fateful encounter between these two officers. Durnford had expected fresh orders to be waiting for him at the camp, but found that there was none. So he immediately sought out Palain to ascertain the camp situation. Palain, who despite facing an obvious uncertainty as to Durnford's new role in the camp, reported numerous sightings of Zulu. The troops were deployed and scouts had been posted among the hills surrounding the camp. 
Bombarded with conflicting intelligence reports, Durnford was becoming convinced that the Zulu were attempting to divert British eyes. To him, it seemed that the real danger was posed by the Zulu attempting to isolate Chelmsford's column. He would have been aware, through the orders he had received and through Pallane, that Chelmsford had already left the camp at around 4 a.m. Um, and this effectively meant that the column was now several miles to the southeast and thus had a considerable head start. As a result, Durnford decided to ride out with his mounted troops to protect Chelmsford's flank. He also requested that Pallane attach two of his infantry companies for support. Naturally, this is something Pallane was not able to do. He was duty bound to protect that campsite and there was absolutely no way he was going to weaken the camp defences by loaning his troops to Durnford. Feeling under pressure, not just from Plain, but also other members of the 24 foot, Durnford did not pursue the request any further. It is revealing of Durnford's character that despite the veneer of professional courtesy he displayed during this meeting with Plain, it also demonstrates his willingness to, uh, to use his superior rank as a brevet colonel to interfere with a well-established chain of command. Furthermore, it is obvious that Durnford sought to exploit the ambiguity of, Dur uh, of Chelmsford's orders. At 11.15 a.m., Durnford's rocket battery and their escort had finally arrived at the camp. They had marched there throughout the morning from Rourke's Drift. Durnford ordered, ordered his Sakali horse contingent under the command of Lieutenants Raw and Roberts onto the Inyoni Heights to scout for any Zulu movements. He then completed his deployments by posting men at the base of the Tallahaney Ridge, providing additional support for Plains men. A quarter of an hour later, Durnford set out eastwards with his troops. Considering that these men were now utterly exhausted, he ordered the rocket battery to follow him only when they felt ready to do so. Durnford clearly hoped that with this forward movement, he would prevent a Zulu attack from surprising Chelmsford's column. Again, what Durnford would not have realized was that during the previous day, the main bulk of the Zulu army had in fact advanced from Sapezi, completely outmaneuvering Chelmsford's column on their left flank as they did so. As the morning progressed, British scouting parties continued to sweep the camp's perimeter. By this stage, Lieutenant Raw and his men were now several miles away, heading towards the Nakutu Plateau to the northeast of the campsite. The air was now oven hot, and through the shimmering haze, Raw caught sight of some Zulu boys herding cattle. Upon sight of the approaching cavalry, the figures naturally broke off and ran. Reaching the crest of a large valley, the riders were forced to pull back on their reins and had lost their fleeing prey. But as they surveyed their surroundings, an unexpected sight greeted them. And make no mistake, this sight was truly terrifying to behold. As far as the eye could see, a large bulk of at least 12,000 warriors were sat in complete silence within the base of the valley. Upon seeing the stunned men on horseback, all 12,000 pa pairs of eyes now stared right back. At that very moment, this vast wave rose to its feet and advanced towards the cavalrymen with frightening pace. Some of the riders dismounted and raised their rifles at the oncoming horde. Frantic, unnerving gunfire crackled through the morning air and could be heard for miles around. These opening salvos marked the beginning of a clash of empires, a truly tragic conflict that was to have dire consequences for the nations involved and proved to be one of the most disastrous episodes in British military history. Raw and his men had now stumbled upon the bulk of the Zulu army. The Zulu, realizing they had been compromised, immediately seized the initiative. Seeing the sheer weight of Zulu bearing down upon them, many native troops within this party, who were armed with nothing more than a spear and shield, simply dropped their weapons and fled. The Battle of Isandawana had begun. As gunshots pierced the morning air, those within the camp became anxious. Their anxiety rose still further when leading elements from Rawls' party stormed through the camp bearing news that a significant Zulu force was now headed their way. Hopefully, 
This next slide will give you a really good idea as to what the British and their allies were facing on that day. The numbers alone are truly terrifying. The Zulu were now advancing quickly, and uh, returning patrols had finally reached Durnford, who by now were several miles outside the camp. The scouts reported that he was in danger of being cut off if he continued with his advance. At that very moment, Durnford's column was confronted with a huge mass of Zulu warriors coming right at him. This was the Zulu left horn. So I have shown you the slide of the various Zulu regiments involved and their order of battle. Now it is time to see how this was put into practice. This is the horns of the buffalo, a military tactic created during the formation of the Zulu Empire under Shaka and was subsequently perfected through the years. This was an offensive formation that was deployed on a large scale with a double envelopment of the enemy. Um, the left and right horns, comprising of mostly younger, faster warriors, would whip around the flanks, whilst the center or chest would draw the enemy in and put pressure on them through sheer weight of numbers. When this was achieved, the left and right horns would then converge cutting off the enemy's escape route and potential supply lines. If this was not achieved, a reserve unit in the form of the loins would then deploy wherever they were needed to bolster the attack. In the British camp, Helene was desperately trying to figure out what to do. The tactical situation had changed dramatically and events were now moving incredibly fast. He was now faced with an unsettling truth. A large army was heading his way, and due to the speed of the Zulu, it is no exaggeration to suggest that he literally had minutes to decide. The British knew that a Zulu attack would threaten one or both of their flanks, and thus the best means of countering this was to deploy men along an extended line to meet this threat. Plain followed this rule as best as he could, and deployed his troops accordingly. However, at this stage of the battle, the intelligence reports he had received seemed to suggest that the Zulu were advancing solely from the northeast. At this time, Pelayne could not see Durnford and thus would not have been aware that his troops were now heavily engaged. Red-coated troops from A, H and G companies maintained their positions guarding the northeast approach, whilst F Company, alongside two companies of NNC, were sent to support E Company up on the Tallahaney Ridge. C Company and auxiliary units formed a protective guard to their rear. Now enter the horns of the buffalo. One of the first victims of the Zulu assault was the slow-moving rocket battery under the command of Major Francis Russell of the Royal Artillery. The battery had set out just after Durnford's departure from the camp. It was escorted by nine men from the 1st Battalion, 24 foot, as well as D Company, 1st Battalion of the 1st NNC Regiment. Due to the rapidity of Durnford's advance, they were left at least two miles behind and were completely isolated from the nearest friendly units. Having reached the base of the Conical Hill, they had absolutely no idea what was about to descend upon them. As the battery struggled forward, they were cut off immediately by leading elements of the Zulu left horn, which had now crested the ridge above them. Stunned by the sudden appearance of the Ingo Bermakosi regiment, Russell gave the order to fire. A single hail rocket screamed overhead, showering some Zulu with burning propellant as it went, and exploding harmlessly against the surrounding hillside. In response, at a hundred yards, the Zulu unleashed a volley of musket fire, Cutting down three gunners, and Major Russell lay mortally wounded, having fallen from his horse. The Zulu skirmishers then scythed through the British position. The mules and horses used to transport the rockets bolted, and somewhere in this confusing melee, the panicked survivors were forced to fight their way out, running for their very lives. At that same moment, Durnford was making a fighting retreat towards the camp, and he was able to extricate some of the frightened survivors as he did so. Up on the heights to the north of the camp, F Company, under the command of Captain Mostyn, and E Company, under Captain Kavai, 
were shocked to see a large bulk of Zulu moving from right to left 800 yards from their position. This was the Zulu right horn. The Zulu refused to engage and continued to, uh, to sprint to the left of the British positions. It was now midday, and Lieutenant Stafford had only just returned to the camp from Rourke's Drift when he heard significant rifle fire erupting from the ridge to the north. Realising that the British flank had been turned, Stafford and 50 NNC infantry headed up onto the heights to help protect the left and rear approaches of the camp. For the first time during the battle, the men on that ridge line caught sight of the numbers they were facing as more and more Zulu swept before them. Likewise, Pelain was aware that he was being outflanked, and if elements of the Zulu right horn came down from the Inyoni, which is this bit right here, um, it would effectively cut off his three companies fighting on the Tallahany Ridge. He sent his adjutant, Lieutenant Time of Melville, up onto the ridge to order the men to retreat. With fire and maneuver tactics, the survivors successfully made their way back towards the camp. Sadly, in the chaos that followed, this order never reached Second Lieutenant Edward Dyson, Kavai's second in command, whose small group was quickly surrounded and overwhelmed. Lieutenant Stafford had finally reached the base of the ridge, but rather than retreating to the camp, he spun his men around to cover the crest. At that moment, several Zulu appeared, perfectly silhouetted against the skyline. Clearly, they had not anticipated being met with resistance at its base and paid a terrible price for this mistake. However, the British retreat from the ridge meant that the Zulu right horn was now completely unopposed. And for the defenders, it was a terrifying thought knowing that these warriors were going to appear again soon. It was a question of where and when. As F, E and C companies withdrew from the ridge, the British regular troops then formed up and deployed into extended order in front of the camp. The two mounting guns of N Battery under Lieutenant Curling were placed between Lieutenant Porteous A Company on the left and Captain Wardell's H Company on the right. Plain also ordered troops from the NNC to plug the gaps in his line, particularly between H Company and Lieutenant Pope's G Company from the 2nd Battalion. The two mounting guns were now brought into play. Shrapnel shells, designed to burst over the heads of the enemy, showered the Zulu with lethal, white-hot metal fragments which caused terrible injuries. It was at this moment that the men in the British firing line saw, for the first time, the advancing Zulu chest, and I feel it really is a testament to their bravery and courage that they held firm, as thousands upon thousands of Zulu appeared before them, wave after wave. Before long, the Zulu were now within a thousand yards, then 900, and they just kept coming. At 800 yards, the British line opened up with a devastating volley of rifle fire. Many Zulu fell at this stage of the battle. And this is what the Zulu were up against in terms of British weapons technology. This is the Martini Henry, a breech loading, single shot, lever action rifle. It first entered service in 1871, with production ending in 1899, when it was replaced by the Lee Metford. The Martini Henry, in its many variants, remained in service throughout the British Empire until 1918. During the Anglo-Zulu War, however, the rifles presented some serious problems. The cartridges, for one, were made of a weak rolled brass, which, when overheated, tended to expand or tear open within the rifle chamber. Through, um, through continuous firing, this led to stoppages, which could be extremely difficult to clear. In this second slide, we have the seven pounder mounting gun and the Zulu were now feeling the full weight and devastating effects of these weapons. Under heavy fire, it became obvious that the Zulu chest attack was beginning to falter. The rate of the advance had slowed and the Zulu were now forced to ground. For the Zulu, this was a truly horrific time. As British bullets and shell fire continued to cut through their ranks, bodies and parts of bodies littered the ground. Torn shields lay everywhere, 
And the screams of agony among the wounded and the dying must have been absolutely appalling. Incredibly, despite overwhelming numbers, the Zulu attack was checked. Morale remained high within the British firing line, although ammunition was beginning to run dangerously low. Every British regular stationed at Athi Sandawana carried 70 rounds of ammunition in total. This comprised of four boxes of 10 bullets, plus another 30 held loose in their canvas expense bags. Under increasing pressure from the Zulu, it is likely that these troops were firing rapidly at a rate of around six rounds per minute. With that in mind, this meant that after just 12 minutes of continual firing, that primary source of ammunition would have been completely expended. Ammunition was trickling through to the British firing line, but not nearly fast enough to compensate for the ever-increasing ever demand. The actions of men like quartermaster Edward Bloomfield, who flatly refused to issue ammunition to men who did not belong to the 2nd Battalion, 24 foot, certainly did not help matters either. This, coupled with the ammunition defects already mentioned, saw the rate of fire from the British line diminish significantly. Meanwhile, to the right of the camp, Durnford and his men were facing increasing pressure. They were forced to retreat to the Neogani Donga, a dried water course which offered some protection at least from the marauding Zulu. It is astonishing to think that with just 150 men, all of which were running low on ammunition by this stage, they managed to single-handedly hold back the Zulu left horn, a force of around 5,000 warriors, to put that into perspective. Undoubtedly, Durnford was an incredibly complex character, but his actions alone during this period also demonstrate an incredible courage and leadership which simply cannot be ignored. Plain could now see Durnford, uh, and could see that he was coming under some serious pressure. And so he ordered one of his artillery pieces to traverse and support Durnford's beleaguered troops. Despite the additional fire support from the main camp, this strong point did not last. The Zulu left, ha uh, left horn proceeded to outflank Durnford's position and immediately began spilling into the Donga to his right. To make matters worse, an undefended gap was also forming between Durnford's northernmost troops and the right flank of the G Company. It was a sizable gap, estimated to be around 1,000 yards. Seeing this, G Company, who were not heavily engaged uh, at this time, may have swung 90 degrees to deny their right flank. Simultaneously, Durnford was forced to withdraw as a Zulu flanking maneuver was rendering his position untenable. Um, meanwhile, in the main British line, uh, line, it was a very dangerous time. The shortage of ammunition was becoming acute, and the firing line was beginning to crumble as a result. Pelaine ordered for a bugle to be sounded, rec recalling his remaining troops back towards the camp. Seeing this, the Zulu chest now rose again and advanced a full sprint towards the British line. F and E companies suffered the full brunt of this attack, and a second breach in the British line appeared, and this time, the results were catastrophic. With the Zulu now at extreme close range, the two artillery pieces began firing case shot. In essence, these shells delivered the same devastating injuries that would be associated with a point-blank shotgun blast. However, the Zulu now had the advantage as the British troops were forced to withdraw. Many of these troops were simply cut down as the Zulu wave rolled over them. Other breaches began to appear when troops of the NNC, who had already expended their meagre supply of ammunition, began to break away from the British line. For many of these native troops, armed with billhooks, spears and shields, they received absolutely no mercy for they were seen as traitors by the Zulu. Clearly, it was Pelaine's intention to withdraw the troops to replenish their ammunition and hold the second line. But it was already too late. The Zulu were now behind the British lines and surging through the camp. A terrible panic had set in. Men were running in all directions, animals were bolting, and amongst the swirling dust and confusion, the Zulu were amongst them 
striking men down as they went. The bell tents within the camp proved to be a deadly obstacle for the unwary. Men would trip and stumble, only to be rushed by groups of Zulu and finished off. They also tried to hide within the tents, backing into a corner and challenging any Zulu to enter. Instead, the Zulu would thrust their spears through the white canvas. They knew they had got their intended victim from the terrible screams and seeing the material turn from white to red. Many of the survivors were now forced into rallying squares, fighting desperate shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder battles. The muskets that the Zulu carried were brought into play, and given their proximity to these frightened men huddled in tight groups, even those antiquated weapons were still capable of doing some serious damage. The exodus had now begun. Lieutenant Charlie Pope and his second-in-command of G Company met a grisly fate between the Sandawana and the Sony Kopi. We can safely identify these two officers because Zulu accounts state that they had killed two officers with glass covering their eyes. Both Pope and his second-in-command were the only officers to wear monocles. One officer was shot, whilst the other was felled with a spear through the chest. We cannot be certain as to who this was, but according to a Zulu account, the officer then tried to pull the weapon from his chest, only to be rushed again. Meanwhile, amidst the mayhem, Durnford had rode into the camp trying to find Pelayne. Astonishingly, his men were still holding the Zulu left horn, and this allowed men to escape. Retreating through an area known as the Saddle, the men on foot stood little chance. They could neither outrun nor outmaneuver the nimble Zulus. Those who were fortunate enough to be on horses fared slightly better given the speed advantage, but men were still thrown from their saddles um, and as they were basically speared or shot. Durnford and the remnants of his command were overwhelmed near the Stony Kopi. And what this effectively meant was that there was now nothing stopping the Zulu horns from converging. Seeing the massacre that was unfolding before them, many of the unarmed cooks, stewards and drivers within the camp began making their way through the saddle, only to see, to their horror, the Zulu right horn now cutting across them. The horns converged and effectively sealed the camp's fate. In these final moments, there is an interesting story regarding the two men credited with attempting to save the Queen's colour of the 24th foot. Lieutenant Time of Melville rode out of the camp clutching the colour. He was following Lieutenant Neville Coghill, orderly to Colonel Glynn, who had left the camp at around 1pm. For many years after the battle, these two men were seen as making a heroic dash to save the colours. However, in more recent times, it has been speculated that the truth may be slightly different and even more damning for one of the men. For those of you who may not be familiar with the concept, as well as being powerful symbols of regimental history and loyalty, in dire situations, the Queen's colour was used as a means of rallying the troops and stealing them for a final stand. Losing the colours was seen as the greatest, uh, the, uh, the greatest disgrace to befall a regiment, and it symbolised complete defeat. And yet, the colours were never unfilled by Melville. In fact, Melville never even joined one of these final pockets of resistance. Could it be then that Melville was in fact transporting the colours as a means of escaping the battlefield? The accepted notion at the time was that Pelayne had ordered him to take it to safety. However, given the utter chaos that was now sweeping through the British camp, it is likely that Pelayne was already dead and thus never gave that order. We will come back to their story in a moment because starting at 1 p.m., in a surreal case of natural symbolism, a partial eclipse occurred, blanketing the battlefield in twilight. During this time, one of the final pockets of British resistance occurred on the eastern slopes of the Sandawana and the Saddle. The remnants of C Company, under the command of Captain Reginald's young husband, have fought their way through the chaos and managed to gain the high ground on the slopes of the hill. 
Of all the British companies who fought that day, C Company was initially the most fortunate in the sense that their left and rear flank had been partially protected by the hill for much of the battle. However, this advantage has since dissipated. They were now surrounded on three sides by thousands of Zulu, with their backs against the Sandalwana. With thousands of Zulu spread across the landscape before them, words cannot even begin to express how frightening this sight must have been for those men. Another group of mixed units were fighting a desperate battle on the saddle. Cut off and surrounded, they were defending one of the crucial ammunition depots. It seems a young husband and this group of around 60 men made a final charge to reach their trapped comrades. A Zulu warrior's account of their final moments is particularly powerful. It reads, they fought well. A lot of them got on the steep slope under the cliff of the camp and the Zulus could not get at them at all. They were shot and bayoneted as fast as they came up. At last, the soldiers gave a shout and charged down upon us. There was an Induna in front of them with a long flashing sword, which he whirled around his head as he ran. It must have been made of fire. They killed themselves by running down, for our people got above and quite surrounded them. These, and a group of white men on the neck, were the last to fall. And this is the spot today. I hope you would agree with me that this was an incredibly brave end by any standards. On the western slopes of Isandawana, around 30 men from the NNC had also attempted to hold the Zulu right horn. However, these men were quickly overwhelmed. With the convergence of the Zulu horns, the camp had fallen, and the survivors were now faced with a hellish nine-mile run across open country to reach the Manzanyama River through what has become known as the Fugitive's Trail. We must bear in mind that these men were now utterly exhausted. They had been fighting all day with heavily bruised shoulders from the recoil of their rifles. They were also equipped with clothing and equipment that was dreadfully unsuited for a long distance run over uneven ground in temperatures hovering around 40 degrees centigrade. They made for easy pickings for the Zulu and undoubtedly they were terrified for their, for their lives. For the men who were lucky enough to reach the river, fresh horrors now awaited them. The raging torrents proved to be a deadly obstacle, made worse by the arrival of the Zulu reserve. These warriors, who had spent most of the battle finishing off stragglers, were now descending on the riverbank in force. Due to the uneven terrain, the survivors were forced to descend the steep rocky banks in single file, Many lost their footing and were simply swept away and drowned. Others were caught by the Zulu as they attempted to make their way down. Amongst this struggling mass were Lieutenants Melville and Coghill. Whilst negotiating the fast-flowing river, Melville was flung from his horse when it was shot. He was forced to abandon the Queen's colour as it was too waterlogged to safely carry across the river. Coghill who had reached comparative safety of the opposite bank, saw that Melville was in trouble and bravely plunged into the river once more to save him. There is absolutely no denying Coghill's bravery. To plunge back into that river to save a comrade under heavy fire is testament to this. However, there, there is also no avoiding as to why he had left the camp so early. Whether he had left the camp under orders or was simply leaving to save his own skin will never be known. But despite the odds, the two men reached the opposite bank. They were now utterly exhausted, and with Coghill's previously damaged knee, they could go no further. In more recent times, an equally interesting theory has arisen regarding their fate, which, according to some historians, came from a, an unexpected angle. Initially, the accepted notion was that the two men had been swarmed by a group of Zulu who, cr who had crossed the river after them. However, there is an intriguing alternative to this point of view. Furious at losing the two escapees, the Zulu apparently called over to a group of native settlers who were gathered on the Natal side of the river, drawn by the noise of the battle, this group was threatened with reprisals if it did not finish off the two white men. 
the sight of hundreds of Zulu swarming on the opposite bank may have given rise to fears that a Zulu invasion of Natal was imminent, and furthermore, no one and nothing was left now to prevent them. So perhaps that thought alone, provided this account is accurate, would have given enough to provoke this group to set upon and kill the two men. By 3 p.m., it was all over. The final pockets of organized British resistance had been overcome, and the Zulu immediately set about the camp. Undoubtedly, there would have been men who were still alive when the camp fell, either playing dead or were too wounded to move. Once discovered, however, their end must have been absolutely appalling. There is also an intriguing account of a red-coated survivor who did not take part in C Company's final charge, but instead managed to squeeze into a tiny cave within the Sandalwana. From this position, this soldier held a final stand, bayoneting or shooting any Zulu who drew near. According to Zulu sources, he held his ground until dusk. Frustrated by this last display of resistance, the Zulu fired a ragged volley into the cave. This powerful and almost mystical image that you see before you defies the brutal reality of what truly happened to this soldier. His corpse was later found near the cave entrance with a rope around his neck, having been stabbed multiple times. This man, whoever he was, has subsequently passed into legend as perhaps the last survivor of the 24th Regiment of Foot. For the Zulu, the priority was now water. The battle had raged all day and the men were incredibly thirsty, drinking whatever they could lay their hands on, from alcohol to paraffin. They then ransacked the camp, with rifles and ammunition being of the highest premium to the Zulu. Although it serves as another macabre part of this battle, there is an aspect of this story which is worth talking about in a broader context. In the aftermath of the battle, Zulu warriors engaged in Kwa Kwa, the ritual disembowelment of enemy corpses to release the spirit of the deceased. This was the second of a three-part practice which was regarded as a powerful moment of interaction with the spirit world. For the Zulu, this was more of a spiritual act rather than an atrocity per se, but nonetheless, the sight of bodies having been butchered in such a manner would have been truly horrific. For British troops in the field, it was undoubtedly a shocking sight and provoked uncontained fury contributing to increased British brutality during the conflict. The reason why this is significant is twofold. Firstly, it emphasizes the huge cultural gulfs between the two sides. And secondly, once stories of these mutilations had reached the British public, it added a particularly bitter edge to the public and military reaction. If we, for a moment, take our focus away from the complexities and moralities of the British calls in South Africa, and focus on soldiers reacting to what they saw, it's not hard to see why this was the case. Zulu casualties are extremely difficult to determine, as many of the wounded were either overlooked after the battle or had crawled away to die, and thus were never recovered. It is sobering to think that these men lay out there, unable to move, and may well have fallen foul, not just from their wounds, but also predators and the elements. Upon hearing the news that unfolded at Isandalwana, Lord Chelmsford apparently placed his head in his hands and lamented with the words that you see before you. And for good reason, because his accountability for what happened at Isandalwana simply cannot be ignored. Firstly, he neglected his own field orders, which were issued in December 1878. These orders stated that all camps, whether temporary or permanent, should be entrenched in hostile territory. He also did not challenge Clary on his selection of the campsite, nor did he acknowledge its tactical disadvantages. He then made a serious blunder by splitting his force, weakening the camp's defences considerably. Despite several increasingly urgent notes from Palaine, Chelmsford did not seem to appreciate the true danger to the camp and refused to send help. And finally, he made the fatal mistake as a military commander of underestimating his enemy. Clearly, this stemmed from a superiority complex during colonial times, but also from the apparent ease in which Saheo's homestead was destroyed. 
His strategy, therefore, revolved around finding the Zulu and bringing them to battle, rather than making sure he was not taken by surprise. And in the aftermath of the battle, Chelsford was quaking in his boots, Firstly, because he realised that the Zulu were a serious proposition, and secondly, because London had now heard of the disaster and he was faced with losing his job. As a result, he did everything he could to conceal his flaws in this debacle by tarnishing the names of two officers, namely Durnford and Plain. Dead men do not have a voice and thus were never going to challenge his version of events. And for many years, it was Chelmsford's version that shone through. I'm sure you would agree that this was a truly shocking behaviour from a military commander. Um, so what was the cost of this battle? Well, whenever I do historical lectures, in a way, I don't like to measure cost by statistics, primarily because no human should ever be seen as a mere statistic. And secondly, each one accounts not just for that individual, but also the broader ripple effect of the impact on friends and family. But to give you the best estimates available, out of a force of 22,000 warriors, between 1,500 to 2,500 Zulu were killed that day. On the British side, of the 67 officers and 1,707 men in the camp at the beginning of the battle, 1,387 were killed. Uh, we also need to consider that this number was further inflated by the 350 or so unarmed cooks, drivers, etc., so who were also in the camp. So the overall casualty rate was even higher. The Battle of Isandawana was a stunning victory for the Zulu, make no mistake about it, but it also served as a high watermark of the Zulu during the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879. And we need to be absolutely clear about this. This conflict was started without the direct approval or knowledge of the British government. In fact, it was started by a group of colonial administrators who based the invasion on trumped up charges of, of Zulu aggression, of border disputes, of racial prejudices, of economic gain, and the seizure of natural resources. The list goes on. But the point is, I'm sure for many of you, this sounds scarily familiar. How many times, even in the modern age, have we heard about conflicts being started due to one or a number of these same headings? Likewise, it also goes without saying, really, that we must spare a thought for the families of the soldiers or warriors who were killed. Because if you knew that your son or father had been killed in this illegitimate conflict, regardless of what side you were on, you would be feeling incredibly bitter about it, perhaps even wanting revenge for it. And that is exactly what men like Frere were relying upon. It had the desired effect. The fall of the 24th Regiment of Foot gave the British public their reason for that fight to now continue. And from that point on, the British were always going to return in numbers and material strength that the Zulu could never have handled. Um, unfortunately, there really is no way to bring this lecture of the battle or indeed broader conflict uh, to a positive conclusion. But one thing I will say is this, I feel it really is a testament to the enduring legacy of this battle that on its 145th anniversary, it still generates enough interest for you to have attended this lecture. So perhaps that in itself is something. Thank you all so much for listening. And it is my earnest hope that this talk has inspired you to research this fascinating subject further. Um, and if you enjoyed this talk and would be happy to write a review, please email me at battlefield underscore echoes full stop 167 at yahoo.com. Via this medium, I'm more than happy to discuss this subject with you further uh, or receive feedback, good or bad. So please feel free to get in contact. Thanks again, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, thanks very much, Michael. It was a really fascinating talk um, about a gripping subject and really the granular detail of how you took us through the events was, uh, I found, incredibly interesting. Um, so I've got a, got a roving mic here. So if anyone has a question they'd like to ask, please raise your hand. Um, I'm going to ask you for the benefit of our listeners online, and there's quite a few of them. When I pass you the mic, could you please keep it close to your lips when you speak? Mm -hmm.
Thanks for the talk. Um, the question is not directly about what you've talked about, and you don't have to answer it. Where did your interest in the Zulu Wars come from? <laughs> the film Zulu, I think, is probably the... Uh, uh, as with a lot of uh, young lads, I, I watched Zulu. Um, and one of the things that struck me when I watched that film is the mention of the Sandwana. Um, and after researching it, uh, going into a lot of detail about it, it made me then look into the broader conflict, which I just find fascinating. So, uh, in essence, Zulu. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, there's a question from the one of someone in the online audience. Um, is it true that there was an issue of the magazine boxes not being able to be opened and that contributed to the the massacre yes uh so that, that that's one that i will leave open to debate but in my personal experience only because i have known people who have made exact replicas of these same ammunition boxes and have given demonstrations of how quickly to operate them and open them um basically even with a sharp not with a rifle but these things will open um there are other people that say otherwise. I mean, I'm sure that if you ask that 10 different people, they probably give you 10 different answers. But in my personal opinion, from the people that I know who have made these boxes and have given them under rigorous testing, uh, that is very much the case. So in my opinion, there wasn't a difficulty opening them. Okay, any more questions? Okay. Thank you. Um, early on, you mentioned that the Zulus had access to uh, muskets, yes. uh, somewhat antiquated. Can you explain um, how they got them and how they were trained to use them? Sure. Um, so we, in terms to answer that one, we actually need to go back to um, the early 1870s. Uh, so basically, there was uh, an incident called the Bushman's River, uh, River Pass incident. Um, and basically, they discovered diamonds in that area in Kimberley. Now, where the rifles come in and their training is the fact that as a means of paying off labor, um, these particular tribes, including the Zulu, were issued with these rifles and these ammunition and were trained how to use them. Um, so basically, they did have these rifles to hand. They weren't particularly good with them, but in essence, that was one of the ways that they got them. They also stole quite a lot from the boar as well, so their main enemy. Um, and again, they weren't particularly good with them. So, uh, But that is, in essence, how they got them uh, through these instances of basically paying them, but with rifles. Uh, I hope that answers it. Thank you. Can I just use this occasion to make one other point? Sure. Um, and I wouldn't have made this unless you mentioned the film Zulu, yes. which you did. Um, as an amateur historian of the Warwickshire Regiment, yes, and uh, not to be confused with the Royal Warwickshire Regiment, yeah. the film strongly gave more than the impression that it was a Welsh regiment. Yes. Let me just uh, remind the audience it was the 24th of foot was the Warwickshire Regiment and remained so until the Childers uh, report of 1881, two years later, when he became the, um, the South Wales borderers. I've tried for many years. There's a small bunch of us who were born and bred in Warwickshire who have fought a losing battle to convince the public <laughs> that he was not a Welsh regiment. Yes. Thank you. Okay, I think we have a, another comment, question here. You're quite right about the Warwickshire Regiment, but actually most of the men in, was it the 2nd Battalion, the 24th, uh, the Warwickshire Regiment, they were men from South Wales. Um, they weren't Englishmen, uh, by and large. There were a few English officers, but most of the soldiers were, were, were Welshmen. I joined the 24th Regiment of Foot in Hong Kong. Uh, there were four direct descendants in the battalion when I was a hitch, a hook, and two Williamses. Um, so, so, so you're quite right about the name, but I'm not sure you're entirely right about the, the people who are in, in the regiment. Ah. So, so can we still all believe that they sang Men of Harlem? Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, that's the most uh, yeah. important thing, isn't it? Um, 
but so I'll come to you in one second, but for another question from the online chat. Sure. Um, was it a, a, a section of the Zulu force at Isandwana that then went on to, uh, to, to do battle at Rourke's Drift? Yes. So uh, in terms of that particular instance, it is uh, a Zulu reserve who went to Rourke's Drift, or, or more specifically, a section of the reserve. It wasn't the entire reserve. Um, so basically, uh, as I kind of hinted in terms of this uh, this talk, um, most of the time they hadn't been um, engaged in battle in any way. They were a couple of them were finishing off stragglers, but it was basically made up of the Zulu reserve. None of them had been in much in the way of combat during the day, um, and uh, yeah, basically, I mean, they were looking at Rourke's Drift, and and because momentum was on their side, they were there thinking, well, yeah, let's just pick a fight with Rourke's Drift now because we, you know, we wiped out the British at Isandawana, and let's now pick a fight with Rourke's Drift and see how we get on and plunder some of the, the you know, the supply depot there. Um, but yes, in, in essence, it is the Zulu Reserve. It is not the guys that fought at Isandawana. And I think we'll have time for one last question. Then I'm afraid we have to wrap it up so that the staff can. Well, right, two last questions. <laughs> so we've got yeah, one yeah. here, and then uh, because then the staff need to lock up the building. Okay, please yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just what was the the uh, the fate of the British commander of Plain? What, what, what actually happened to it? Do, do we know? Uh, to Plain, uh, we don't know. Is the honest truth? Um, I mean, basically, he um, one of the some of the accounts are a bit sketchy. In terms of him, um, some people say that uh, when the camp was beginning to be overrun, he went into his tent and started writing letters. Other people say that he was in one of the final pockets of resistance in the saddle. Uh, but it is literally very, very difficult to determine where he was and what he was doing in those final moments. Um, we can only go on some of these accounts and some of them are very vague at best. So, um, yeah, it is a case of trying to pick together the best bits and, and you know, hope that you're relatively accurate in that respect. Okay, and last question. Yeah, I, I was just wondering whether there's the same level of interest in the battle in South Africa with Zulu descendants and perhaps they're sitting yes. around having a similar lecture tonight and... Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. I mean, um, in, in terms of the battle sites themselves, um, there is a lot of Zulu there because firstly, they're very proud of this victory. Um, and secondly, when they are there, it's very much for spiritual reasons. I mean, we got to bear that in mind in terms of what I was saying about before. All of it is dictated by the spirits of their ancestors and that is what they are there to honour. So absolutely, you do see them at Rock's Drift, you see them at Isandawana, Jinjin Delovu, Kambula, Alundi, you see them on those sites, basically.